Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us here this time together. Um, uh, it's uh, when you're at a small conference and you do a relatively niche <laughs> type talk. It's always a wonder as to who's going to uh, join you. Isn't that true? <laughs> uh, Nicole had the opportunity to, to speak last year, and uh, it was her, her, myself, her brother, and one of our administrators. Oh, and the camera guy. We were counting everybody, everybody in the room. So. Um, but it was great, we had an awesome time, and I hope that'll be true for you today, too. Uh, so if you are an art educator, then you're in the right place. If you are a regular classroom teacher, and I don't use that word regular in derogatory way in any shape, form, or fashion, uh, you're in the right place. And if you happen to be a classroom teacher who also has to do art from time to time, <laughs> then you are definitely in the right place. Um, so let's pray together and we'll get going. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for today. And uh, we thank you for every beat of our heart, every breath that we take. Uh, it is a gift from you. Uh, but in these moments, uh, Father, we just appeal to you and praise you for being our creator uh, and the creator of all things. Uh, Father, we thank you that um, you stepped back and you saw that all that you had made uh, was good, that you didn't have to declare it good because it was already good because you made it. And we thank you too that we have been made in your image, that we are literally image bearers of you. And because of your vast creativity, Father, we have that desire to be creative in our lives as well. So we thank you for the privilege of doing that. And Father, we just pray uh, that you would uh, take control of this talk this morning, Father, um, that uh, we would just have an opportunity to not only enjoy what other image bearers have created, um, but Father, that in some way it would always point us back to you and your goodness and glory. So we praise you for that. We thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So you received a uh, copy of an artwork. Um, if you know this artwork, act like you don't. <laughs> but what I'd like for you to do is to find a shoulder partner. And I would like for you just to spend a couple of moments together uh, just reviewing this image, just seeing what you can find and detail-y kind of things. And so just spend some time having that conversation uh, with one another. So I'll leave you to it. What? You can have another one. Okay. <laughs> you have extras. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the children have to share, but. Yeah. <laughs> A little
All right, we're gonna spend some more time uh, looking at this uh, in detail. Um, and there are a lot of different directions we could go after this initial observation period. Um, but let's just spend a couple of minutes just um, kind of cataloging some of the things that are in the image that we've noticed about uh, the image and so we'll spend some time doing that so you get to participate in some way. So what, what are some of the things that you see, notice? It can be very general, it can be very specific, uh, but just give me some feedback as to what, what you're seeing. The shell, the shell is sticking out on the, on the guy on the right. Shell? Okay. Yeah. the right guy. Go ahead. What else? It's almost like a photograph, like they're stopped in mid-motion. Okay. Like they're not moving. They're just kind of like moving around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like they get a little bit like they've been out of some type of war type atmosphere, and then he looks very pampered in the middle because his face does not have the wrinkles or the bandages like the other guys have. Okay, did you say something war type? Did I hear that word? He's right here, the three guys are okay. look like they've been doing something. They've got bandages on them, they have blood, you can see visibly tears and clothes. The guy in the middle looks very, a lot more pampered, like he might be a something higher up. Oh, wow. Pampered, I don't like that word. That's a good word. Awesome. What else? Uh -huh. behind the table almost looks like he maybe I don't know maybe I don't know I don't really know I don't know what he looks like he just looks like he's different from the conversation or what's happening with the three okay that excellent yeah that's great looks like the time period might be darker because of the way that the cast shadows and the way they did the Okay. All right. Yeah. Time of day. Yeah. That's a great observation. Good. 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 <clears throat> Anything else? Just general. Uh, looks like the guy in green. It looks like maybe he's about to stand up. Okay. All right. We talked about photographic looking like kind of in motion. Okay. Yep. Okay. So. I appreciate the portrayal of hands and um, the posture of um, all of the subjects, the composition really, the it, hands really connect. Yeah, it is pretty handsy, isn't it? It's kind of good. Cool. Good. Um, and I'm not entirely sure about the one standing up, but certainly with the characters sitting down, there's a large contrast with age. Okay. The one in the center is all right. clearly young, while the others are pretty old, whether it be the wrinkles on their foreheads. All right, so we'll just call we'll call those the yeah the central characters, age difference. Okay, good. Anything else? Their dress is very different. Again, the three men, which would be kind of that same thing as okay. Okay. Great. All right. So detail with the shell, background guy, stand up. Okay. Good. What's that? Looks like it's the beginning. The beginning of the meal. Yeah, that's a great observation. Why? Why? Why do you think it's the beginning? Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. So let me change the question for just a moment. So what do you think's going on here? What do you th what do you think is going on here? And then. What do you see that makes you think that? Right? So what is going on here? And then what do you see that's actually making you think that to be true for this, for this image? 
meeting. Okay, meeting. Just because they're, they're all gathered together, right? Okay, sure. Okay. Yep, they're all good Baptists. Meet and eat. We're going to meet and eat. <laughs> Excellent. Maybe lower class somehow. Okay. What'd you say? Because they're what? Maybe they're lower class. Okay. Or why do you why, why do you or argument? Okay. So, so the guy is saying maybe like this, I, I'm in favor good. of this guy is saying. Good. All right. So what what do you see in that makes you think they're lower class? Um, definitely the way that they're dressed. Okay. The, uh, almost peasant type um, outfit with the, the two guys who are sitting. And then you said an argument of some sort. Yeah, maybe an argument of some sort. Just the way one guy is either trying to stand up or he's getting pretty heated about what he's saying, and the other guy is telling how big his fish was. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then the guy in the middle is maybe saying, "Well, I favor what this guy is saying." He's pointing to them and his, you know, his head's down. Okay. Maybe I trust him or believe. So him. you said you said guy, and you said guy, and you I said guy. That, well, I that was a woman. I, I told her maybe the softness of the skin and how it's a little more plump and mm -hmm. even like the shape of the lips make me think that that may be a woman. Okay. Yeah, that's it's, it. I'm done. It's, it's good. No, that's it long great hair stuff. Hair long, hair. long hair. Everyone else has short hair. Yes. But it could also easily be a um, noble of some sort intervening in two peasants. In an argument. Okay. Because a, a noble could have the longer hair and the plumber yeah, face because right. they get more yeah. food. More and yeah, talk about that for a minute. That was, I think that was good. Uh, yeah. Is, is that playing into your observation, though? So you're saying a noble person, but even the food. It, well, so maybe, like, it's the noble dinner. Okay. Like, all that food for him. Yeah. And these guys came for an argument to have an argument. And they're sitting down, interrupting his dinner, um, to express or get some sort of closure on the argument mm -hmm. that they're having. And then this guy here might be the servant okay. of this guy. All right. So, in the time period, when you would assume it probably would not be a female, just because of the, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. I find it interesting that if that guy, if that person in the middle <laughs> is noble, that the two other guys sitting down around the table both have bread. So it's like they actually are there to eat. Yes, or yeah. Good. Is there more with the shell? Is there more with the shell? Like, yes, like a deeper, there's a deeper, like, because for me, I think of yeah, birth of Venus. That's the first thing I think of when I think of the shells. Okay, those good. Yes. Greek mythology, so I'm thinking, what's the parallel there? Mm -hmm. What did you say, Nicole? Was there? I was thinking with the shell and, like, Botticelli's birth of Venus, and that's, like, what I think of when I think of shells in oh. art, so I don't know, like. Mm. So she's had a past experience right. or familiarity with an artwork. That she's tying into this one just based on on yeah. this symbol. So yeah. she's bringing in prior knowledge or experience, and that's fine. That's certainly valid. You can yeah. do that. Um, but this exercise says size, for the most part, is about um, what do you see and why do you think that to be true based on what you see. Based on what I see, how can I support my argument that this is what's going on? Okay, and I'm using quite different language with you than I would in the in the classroom. Any other ideas as far as what's going on, who these characters may be? Can I guess who the artist is? Sure. Is it Caravaggio? It is. Very good. Yeah. It's pretty unmistakable. Yeah. <laughs> he always throws in a weird element in every one of his paintings, too. Good. Anything My first else? Thought was that that was Jesus. That this was Jesus? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So why 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 did you think that? Right the hair. I mean just the the way his whatever that is across. Okay. He's portrayed like that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Could be. 
Oh, and if, I mean, if you look at his lower hand, that symbol, like, that's pretty common in iconography. When the hand is going to go like this or like this, it's like a symbol for icons, right? Okay. The, the thumb connecting with, I mean, whichever finger you connect it with is symbolic for the union of divine and human nature. Okay. The three remaining fingers are three fingers, so. so again, based on prior knowledge of other images and seeing a Christ figure in those images, especially iconography, of seeing this kind of two-fingered uh, sign or blessing that would, again, yeah, we're talking about the, not duality, but right. God, yeah, God and humanity, divine. That's great. That's a good observation. Super. Anything else? Okay. So you want me to let you off the hook? <laughs> um, if this was an art activity within the art classroom, um, then I would segue this into more of what would be an art history lesson um, through scaffolding questions um, and validating some of the things that students have already said with regards to the image, uh, trying to lead them to a discovery as a classroom as to what this is about and what's going on. So it is Caravaggio. Uh, this is Supper at Emmaus. So we do have a central Christ figure, and we have a pair of disciples um, on the side. So we know the story, right? After we've journeyed together with Christ um, post-resurrection, um, they invite him to join them uh, for a meal. And it is at the moment in which he blesses the bread that they're like, <gasps> It's Jesus, right? Um, and so that's kind of that moment that Caravaggio just tries to capture for us as well. So I'm glad you said hands because I didn't, I didn't think about that. It's really handsy as far as what everybody's uh, doing uh, say for this guy. Okay. So that, that spot there on his upraised hand, the, the yeah. Sagrada, that's what I was looking for. Up here? Yeah. That spot in the middle of the hand, that wider area, line, is that the fingertip? Mm -hmm. Shadow, that's the shadow. There's some light on the finger. Yeah. And I feel like in the bottom finger, there's some shading there. I mean, in the bottom yeah. hand, there's some shading there as well. Okay. Yeah. okay. So I'm going to take you in, into our history for just a moment, yeah. but this is not what this is about. Um, there is no apparent uh, wounds as far as crucifixion is concerned. So is this Christ in his resurrected bodily state? But yet we know of other encounters with the disciples that the wounds were still present physically. Um, so there, uh, there's not consensus on this, but there is some thought that this is kind of the pre-revelation of who Christ is to these guys, that this is who they were seeing uh, they weren't seeing him as he truly was, and then in that moment of blessing, their eyes are opened and they re recognize that it is. So, you know, Caravaggio is playing with us just a little bit by letting us see kind of what they've been seeing all along and not recognizing it. But anyway, there's not really any strong evidence uh, for that in any shape, form, or fashion. Um, doing this for me uh, found its way um, out of necessity. Um, I use what's called discipline-based discipline art education. I can't get that word out. Um, which is kind of fourfold um, aesthetics, art criticism, art history, and then art production. Um, and in my past teaching experiences, and even this one, we give a whole lot of time and energy uh, to art production and making stuff. Because oftentimes in our kids' minds, that's what going to art is. We're going to make stuff. We're going to do stuff. Um, and so I had a real need to try to recapture those other aspects uh, of art. One more time. Yeah. Aesthetics. Aesthetics, art history, art criticism, and then art production. Because what I was hoping would be that uh, by keeping students engaged and looking at the art for longer periods of time, 
um, that the more they'll get out of the, ex the experience and more that that artwork will become a part of, of who they are and, and who they'll be. Who they'll be. Um, so I, I, I launched into this as just kind of an experience, uh, an experiment based on some other information that I garnered from uh, the Museum of Modern Art in an online class. Um, they were talking about open-ended open -ended inquiry in the museum and some of the techniques that their educators and docents were using uh, in the museum. But um, it was a scary thought um, as far as putting artwork in the hands of, of kids and then wanting them to talk about it and all I get is, right? Um, <laughs> Because that's terrifying, it's just terrifying. Um, but it, I found out it doesn't have to be that way um, because now I know that you can have a room full of raised hands, literally kids jumping up and down because they want to share some observation that they have with you. Um, and then also finding that they're connecting with works of art as well. And so uh, a friend of mine calls it going from crickets to connections. And so there's three, really three questions wrapped up into this one simple strategy. So Beth, if you'll give me the, you're gonna have to, uh, <laughs> yeah, how we're gonna get you there. Okay, just keep advancing. Good, good. Oh, you got more to go. Keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> All right, there we go. Uh, so this is called Visual Thinking Strategies, and it's really based upon three questions. Um, if you'll give me those. Uh, so the first question is, what do you think is going on in this picture? Or just what's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? And then what more can you find? Okay, those three questions. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? But I think that's why it works. Um, I mean, we're just hardwired for stories. You know, we consume stories every day and we kind of remember them easier and more in detail than just facts. And so those three questions really begin students on the path of hopefully writing their own narrative about the artwork that's being discussed and then using the visual, visual information that's present uh, to infer or create some type of meaning. Um, I call it interpretation with justification, okay? I believe this to be true because this is what, what I see. And so I think it's that second question is what makes this thing so powerful. What do you see, all right, that makes you say that, okay? And some of us were referencing other information that we have and know, and that's fine, that's legitimate, okay? But as far as this activity with our students, we're just wanting them to base, be based on what you're seeing, what do you think's going on? And in that process, um, they start looking for contextual clues, which are so important, artistic choices, um, just elements that they may have missed. And for me, it's called the power of because. And I didn't ask this of my students. It just kind of happened. And when I heard it happen, I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was amazing because they did it themselves. They knew that they were going to have to stand up and say, this is what I think is going on. And then I would have to say, okay, so what are you seeing that's making that happen? And so now I'm hearing, well, I think this is going on and this is what's happening because, and then they keep going. All right? And I'm like, yes, they got it. Okay. They're, they're doing it. Okay. Um, and then the last question is just, okay, so we're going to keep um, this ball rolling, right? By looking and continuing to look. And so really your job is just a facilitator. I'm just kind of there to facilitate the questions and, and make helping them make con connections, uh, clarifying ideas, uh, restating what they've said as far as validating their interpretations, and then trying to get new ideas. And so I've seen students begin to open up. They're forging their own personal connections about that. Um, I know that they're honing their communication skills. Critical thinking and reasoning skills are, are um, especially important in this. And then hopefully in the midst of all that, there's this burgeoning uh, love for art that's being uh, you know, put in the hearts and minds of, of, a next, of the next generation. And so I think the benefits uh, as a whole are, are pretty astounding. 
Um, but I had other questions beyond are they going to say anything. Um, it was like, okay, uh, so how do you get students to do more than just you know mumble a couple of words? Um, what if one student wants to take over the conversation? Uh, what if they ask a question that I don't know the answer to, right? Um, how I respond when the class clown makes an inappropriate joke about the image, and what if they just stare into space? Now, um, most of those questions are basic classroom management, all right? Uh, and so I'm sure you're good at that. Um, but here's what I've discovered is that, um, and it took a little time, uh, once you establish that artwork discussions are a normal, and fun, yes, fun part of the class, um, they want to do it, okay? And they'll have plenty to say. Um, but let me give you four things real quick to kind of help you, help you get there. And I know I'm giving you the, the hows and the why, uh, the hows, twos versus the overall whys. Um, but the first thing is just let them gather their thoughts. Um, uh, a friend of mine who's kind of an online mentor, uh, Cindy Ingram, these are kind of her I ideas and she was kind enough to let me borrow them. Um, but you know that no two classes that you have are alike. I, I do this activity once a month in eight different classrooms uh, with eight different classes over the course of two days with students from first grade to 12th grade. Um, and it's a blast. I look forward to those two days with all of those kids. Um, but there's a mix of personalities there. Um, some of the kids are going to come with a dozen thoughts to share. Others need some time to build those thoughts. And so uh, just as you did, I just used those two or three minutes on the front end as you're looking, whether it's by yourself or in conjunction with a shoulder partner, just to kind of help them uh, get their bearings as far as where we're going to go. And I think this really helps set the tone and the focus for the observation and discussion uh, that's going to come. So they, they need that, that time to on, on the front end to kind of just gather themselves um, together with that. And it's kind of fun to hear the, you know, overhear some of the conversations that are going on. Uh, the second thing I want to spend some time plowing on this one um, is to let them own it. Um, and I'm going to say all this and then I'm going to have a big caveat at the end. Uh, one of the reasons that I think students are often hesitant to share their ideas um, is this fear that they're going to be wrong. Are they going to be ridiculed? And, I, and I, I know that's probably true for you in your classroom and other aspects as well. As well. Um, but with this strategy, and here's what's key, is that in that moment, okay, and I'm going to reserve it for that moment, um, that I as an instructor need to not hold on to any one interpretation of the artwork as being better than the other or more right than another one. Um, even... Gosh, I, I would say even the intent and purpose of the artist or some museum person. I mean, art history, art historians, they don't, they don't always agree on the meaning of an artwork. But I'm just coming at this from the fact that everybody sees a work of art through their own lens of personal history and experience. And I think as long as a student can back up their interpretation with evidence from the artwork, then they're not going to be wrong, right? Um, give me the image back, Beth, just one more time. Just, yep, there we go. So, I have a fifth grader. Uh, Mr. Williams, I, I think, and he said, I'm looking at this guy over here on this side, uh, and he's got this seashell, and um, it looks like he's kind of got a cold because his nose is red. And, um, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking he's a fisherman. Who else? Somebody else said fisherman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's a fisherman, and he's telling about his catch of the day, right? That was this big. And then this is his friend who is just shocked, and he's coming up out of his ear. Oh, really? Oh, wow, that's amazing. And he's like, and then the wife is like, yeah, I've heard it all before. You, know, you, guys, you guys just going? And I'm like, fifth grader? Oliver Mutro, I love you, boy. I love you. So that was awesome. Um, uh, one of the others, and I don't remember which, which class it was, um, but again, um, this is the daughter. This is her father. She is presenting her boyfriend, and the father is going, no way. 
<laughs> and the boyfriend's, you know, he's going to stand and, and protest. All right. So, you know, a lot of a lot of different different ways uh, to do that and to go about that. But it's just amazing, uh, just keeping it open ended as much as possible, and the things that they not only come up with, but the things that they discover and the connections um, that they make. Um, this apparently is some symbol having to do with pilgrimage or being a pilgrim. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I always think of a staff as someone being a, a pilgrim, and so Caravaggio thinks kind of playing because of the journey that they were on together with Christ. So he kind of gives us this little little symbol so that's a tip it. And the other thing that I did not do that I think is important is uh, is I didn't give you any context as far as um, artist date or title. Right, um, and I strongly recommend just not doing that at all. At least not until the discussion has kind of taken its course. Um, for me, I don't do that until I know that we're going to be transitioning over into more of a uh, uh, more of an art history kind of scenario. So, um, and some of those artworks really lend themselves to richer discussions when that information is withheld. All right. So let's look at another image real quick. So I'm not going to give you any context. All right. But just take a look at this for just a couple of seconds, right? Try to get a sense. Yes? So when you do this, do you show the same picture to every single class, first grade through 12th grade? Right now I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you, you do not incorporate it, say, like with their Bible or history, like what they're talking about in those areas? Not at the moment, the moment. because they're coming to see me separately from everything else that's okay. going on. But yes, I'm very interested in making those types of connections with the regular classroom, so it might change the way that that looks. Right? Um, for right now, doing it first through 12th is because we've got families that have multiple students across the great, the great spectrum, and they go home and they talk to each other about it. Okay, And so I'm like, yeah, the first time a couple of them came back, yeah, well, we were at supper and, you know, my older sibling and, um, I mean, I just, I teared up and was going to weep. It's just because they had taken it outside of the classroom and made it a part of what they were doing as a, as a family. Okay, so what's your reaction? What do you think? And what, what about this image? Just ideas generally, what's going on, what's about? Discombobulated, awesome. Okay. Good. Okay. So I'm gonna. So if I told you on the front end that this was by Franz Mark, then in 1913, and it is called the Fate of the Animals. Um, some of my older students might connect the name Franz Mark as being German. They might connect the date in history as World War I. Um, and then so, yep, so this is kind of the mechanism of war yeah. and what's happening. Yeah, okay. like yeah. yeah, there's, yeah. there's a, lot of, a lot of power going on there. So I, See the cool. yeah. Yeah. and with Mark, we usually show kids his blue horses. It's nice. <laughs> All right, one more. This is unusual because I don't usually um, use a lot of non-objective art. <laughs> There's usually, you know, characters and things like that. It looks like you took a screenshot of a 1980s video game. <laughs> oh, 80s what? A 1980s video game. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. What's the color on them in the 80s? I can't So yeah, you, you, you immediately, yep. Yeah. As soon as you know what it is and what it's about, it's hard to get beyond. Ask what you know, they know they yes. Know. Um, so this is uh, Pete Mondrian. This is 1942, 43. This is called Broadway Boogie Woogie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was like, I wouldn't have come up with, you know, it wouldn't come up with that title, you know. Um, but if you know Mondrian, we know that we're using the primary colors, we're using, you know, vertical and horizontal lines and, and shapes um, and things. So anyway, so that's just, just knowing that that, that that little bit of information can often, and I'll use the word taint, 
um, um, the exercise. So I just I just kind of say no. Let's not let's not divulge that at just a moment. Um, and then the caveat with all of this is simply um, often there is a particular interpretation of the image. All right. Um, it has purpose and meaning that the artist put into it, especially if we're looking at, at religious imagery. Right? Um, and so if I'm using that, uh, whether it's in history or art history or moving into an art history exercise, um, I, I need that. And I need the students to understand that context. And so uh, in that moment, I have to present what's the best meaning and the best understanding of that image as possible. Um, it can't simply be this relativistic free-for-all where everybody's right in the end and everybody gets a trophy, okay? So I, I just, I reserve that for the exercise itself because certainly it's there. I'm asking you to back it up with the information um, that's in the image. Um, but just know that most of the secular art world would extend that and say, yeah, it's just whatever you think it's supposed to be, and whatever you think it means. And um, I've even read some college texts in which they just pound that home and they basically say, uh, you as the viewer, your interpretation is supreme. It reigns over anything else regardless of authorial intent or artistic intent. And so um, anyway, we do it with the Bible, right? You know, it's like, well, what does that mean to you? you know, well, you just, you don't understand it. And so um, I wrestled with that. Being in this uh, scenario, I wrestled with that. Okay, but yeah, they can be wrong. Okay, when it comes to what it's really all about. Um, but in terms of the exercise, it's okay. Yes. So when you do these, do you do an art production based on what you're doing? Not yet. Okay. Again, that's part of the, part of the goal. I'm just I'm falling in. I'm just a, a year into doing this. Um, <laughs> yeah, my very first day of teaching here. Two years ago, this is what we did uh, that first day. So I'm just like, okay, we're going to try it and just, you know, dive in and away we go. Uh, the third idea would just be embrace the awkward um, after letting them own it. Okay. It's going to get quiet at time to time and you're thinking it's dead and it's over. Um, but I find that that's the time that some of my, uh, some of my introverts will finally kind of speak up and step in. Um, and it's also important to me to move around the room. Um, I'm, I have the benefit of, of Annabeth back here um, advancing my slides for me. Um, but early on, I was kind of at the screen and I had my little clicker here. And so I felt really tied to this and I couldn't connect with what was happening um, way back there. So in my classroom, it's, it's on an art cart and um, whoever's sitting there student-wise, they just run the mouse and I tell them where to click. Um, and they'll do that. We didn't do it on the main image. There are hot spots that you can click and it'll take you to enlarge, zoom in on those particular areas. And I use those extensively with the kids because they're always looking for tiny details. Um, but, you know, this is easy. Just know there's going to be those moments and you're just going to have to let it go. Uh, you know, you're going to have students that want to tell you five different things. Yes, Hannah, baby, I understand. I know that you have five things that you want to tell me, but you're just going to have to tell me one right now, okay? So, um, and then as far as the, the joker in the class, um, I put them on the spot and say, okay, if you believe that to be true, how? Show me. Just ask the same question. You know, what do you see that makes you say that? That's what you're going to, and it has a way of diffusing you know, the, the attention getting that's, that's coming out of that. So, uh, and lastly, have fun. Oh gosh, this is fun. Okay, it is not a lecture. There is not pressure on you to do all the work and to know all the facts. Um, and if you don't, then make it a part of the class to go for, for, figure it out together and look, at, look it up together. So, uh, for me, this is, uh, this is really a dream. How are we doing on time? I want you guys to have time to talk. Okay. Are they going to let us go long, or are we going to try to cut this off? All right, uh, let's move ahead, because the big thing is how do I know what to pick? All right. So these are my three words, intriguing, informative, and if intricate, the three I's. I had three M's, I had three C's, I had three, anyway. Um, 
but these were the best. Uh, intriguing is there is this visceral, almost immediate emotional response when I look at the image, you know. Um, that's important. Um, for me, if I'm curious about the artwork, then my kids are going to be as well. That's going to be infectious. They're, they're going to see it. Um, Dr. Davis mentioned students going to Greece and Italy, and I had the privilege of going with our senior class. That's their, their senior trip over spring break. Um, and so my wife and I got to go with our, our oldest son. And uh, so I, I came back, and the next couple of months we were doing stuff that I got to see, you know, and, um, and that was really special. And that I've been there. <laughs> I got to, you know, I got to see that. Just things that you never thought you would actually wind up standing in front of and, and getting to see. So uh, informative, again, we're just, I mean, I'm looking for a story, message, um, because I think it's easier for kids then to pick up on that as far as what's the tale or easier for them to invent, you know, the plot, their own version, you know, what's happening just before, what's happening after, those kind of things. Um, and then intricate, just because I'm hoping there's enough layers for this thing, you know, to keep keep going. Um, multiple interpretations. So yes, I have to kind of divorce myself from my knowledge of the image and try to think, you know, as far as what else is going to go on or where else might they go with the conversation um, and let them do that. This is what happened and I'll show you these two images. So these are both uh, Bruegel the Elder um, and this is Hunters in the Snow and so this is kind of the one that we normally talk about uh, with, with Bruegel. Um, and then this one is the peasant wedding. And for me, I mean, there's tons of stuff to talk about here as far as where have they been, where are they going. There's all kind of little detail going down here. I mean, these they're curling, okay? I'm just like, that's awesome. You can see they're curling. And other activities that are going on. So a lot of activity in, in both of them, okay? So I thought they both were intriguing. I thought they both were very informative um, as far as uh, layers concerned. But I just saw a little bit more intricacy. Uh, in this and the possibility for stories and so that's the one uh, that I went with so let's look at that for just a quick 130 seconds. Um, it took them a while to figure out that this is actually a barn so we're in a barn okay um, this is the bride she's this is kind of how we signify uh, her um, and then the fun thing and I didn't expect it um, was okay well where's the groom so we spent a lot of time looking at different guys and saying, this could be the groom, this could be the groom, and then why? And, and they came up with awesome answers as to why those possibly uh, could be who they are. Um, historically, the groom probably wasn't there. Culturally, he was not a part of this event on the early during the day. Um, and the bride didn't get to eat or speak. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but anyway, so it was fun. But but the best part was the groans at the end. We spent so much time trying to find the groom, and he's not even there, you know. Um, and then the other part was just related to this little guy down here, okay. Okay, is it a guy? Is it a girl? You know, I don't know. Um, we started looking at hats, and we was like, okay, well, based on the style and the type of hat that the guys are wearing versus what the women are wearing, this is probably, you know, a little boy. But then, wait a minute, he's wearing, he's wearing a dress. So this conversation, so it just kept on going on and on and on. And then, ultimately, we came up with the fact that it was simply practical because pants were very difficult to get on and off. And so this is just easier for potty training. Yes. Mm. Anyway, it was silly. It was, <laughs> it was fun. Um, three real quick ones. Um, Lindsay let me borrow her history cards. We use uh, the Veritas Press um, history cards and so I just kind of rifled through them just to kind of look and to see what was there as far as okay what she what could she do as far as imagery is concerned. So this is uh, Russell's Indians discovering Lewis and Clark. Uh, so I thought that would be a good one to use. The next one, um, yeah this one's awesome. Uh, slaves Waiting for the, for Sale by Crow. Um, and then the third one was um, this one. I, there's not a lot of really good large images for this one for John Sloan. But again, I'm just, again, activity, story, and, and where that can, can go. Um, and then um, sometimes there are additional activities. Go ahead. Um, kind of Charlotte Mason style as far as, and we did a little bit of it as well. 
Uh, with the kids, sometimes I'll just have them just turn it over and don't even look at it anymore, you know, and just tell me. You know, we just make this map of what's going on in the image. Um, a few times I've had them sketch it and draw it. Um, I'm going to get brave one of these days and make them describe it, and I get to draw it okay, based on their description. Um, and then with my uppers, I've, we've done a couple of simple poetry kind of things. Okay. Um, I guess I don't know how to pronounce. Is this Diamante or Diamante? And I don't know this one at all. Anyway. I know what they are and I know what they look, but anyway, these are just some extension activities as far as um, what we were going to do um, in the class. Um, so you have them memory drawing, you have them draw what they study by memory, then you take it away, mm -hmm. and then you have them just pencil or do they do it? Yeah, just a pencil. It's just a quick, quick sketch, and because I just want them to download what they've just looked at. Okay, and then there's there's some magic from here to here and back up again, um, and then just technically, when I first did this, we didn't do it with a the screen. They just had handouts, um, and we worked off of that, and they were great. Um, when I finally got a permanent screen, then I used it, but I built PowerPoint, and especially we were doing the Arnold Feeney portrait, which is just laden with symbolism and there's all kind of little things that are going on. So I just built a slide deck that had those zoomed in portions. Well, it's linear. Um, so by going slide to slide, I was forcing the conversation in the direction that I wanted it to go uh, from moment to moment. And then so um, with a little thought, um, I found that you can actually do hyperlinks in PowerPoint. So give me the next one. So on this main screen, um, these are five hotspots that link to other slides in the presentation. Okay. And so Annabeth could have clicked there, we would have zoomed down on this guy. And then, so that's how that works. Next one, yep. So when you put a shape, you can just, it has a place for links. And the next one, um, then you can tell it you want to use this document and then what slide you want it to connect to. And then once that's done, then I have to go to that slide, and then I have to put something else to get back. This is how I get back to, to home, to my main slide. So that was kind of the way of keeping it a little bit more free-flowing, so now the kids can, we can go wherever they want to go in the image, okay, as far as zooming in and looking and coming back out. Um, and then sometimes there are other things. Um, Caravaggio did another version of this painting five years later. Um, and so that's kind of a part of that presentation when we get to the art history side. Okay, uh, I think that's it. Oh, this is what I want you to yep, write this down, please. Um, I have 11 of these that are done, and they're in a Dropbox, and I'm gonna let you go get in that Dropbox, and you can download and have them all and take them apart and use them as you want. Um, I will continue to add to that Dropbox as well, so the next time I do one, it'll be in that Dropbox for you to get. So this is the bit dot bitly, and then this so db, capital db, Dropbox, PowerPoints, and it is password protected. So CCEC 2019. There are a couple of other things that are in there. There's a, 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 a PDF that'll take you to um, an Amazon page of just recommended resources. I think they're there, keep going real quick. Um, yes, uh, Nicole left this uh, for me, so this is kind of where I started. I just started going through this deck and using the images that were there um, because just the image on the front and then the information about it on the back, that's all I needed. That's all I needed to do to do those was really, really quick. And that's how I wound up doing the other Bruegel because um, you know, hundreds in the, the hunters is in there and I didn't like it and I, so I found the other one, but it was coming out of that deck. Um, we also use this in the class. Uh, this is from Veritas Press, the history of art. Uh, again, there are 32 art cards that talk about the different periods of art and movements of art. Um, and each one has several um, images that are connected to those that were really helpful for me. Uh, Ned Buster did a really great job of putting, putting this together. Uh, let's see, what's the next one? Oh, you got to read this. So Stephen Turley, who is one of our big friends as far as classical Christian education is concerned, this is his little book. Uh, called gazing. It's not practical from the sense of telling you how to do it because what he does is a little bit differently. It's more unpacking the image as a whole, what it really, really means. But he does a great job of 
unpacking all the symbolism and all the Christian meaning. And in this little book, he goes through six or so uh, different images. And so it's great for a resource for you just to be able to go in and, and know more uh, about, about the image that's there. And then this next one is 75 Masterpieces Every Christian Should Know by Claspie. Um, this is art, literature, music, and film. Um, and he goes in tremendous detail with all of these, and it's a beautifully written book, and it's a lot of fun. Um, and if I ever had the opportunity to teach uh, kind of a, a fine arts um, uh, appreciation class, then this would basically be it. This would be my, my text for that. So it's a lot of fun. Really good. And I think there's one more. Um, yep, A Child's Book of Art, Great Pictures, First Words. Um, just on the, on the lower end side of things as far as elementary, if you're just wanting to focus on younger kids, um, this is the book that they, they use this one as well at Logos a lot. So this is one that they recommend. Yep, and then Vincent's Starry Night and other stories. Um, so these focus in on artists and some of their famous paintings and it's, it's told as a story. So it's kind of like this made up activity as far as this is what the artist was doing, but they're short. And, and they're really good. Um, in an art book, the illustrations are horrible. <laughs> I don't know why, but, um, but it's a lot of fun with that. Okay. I think that's it.